Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and here is a cheat sheet of optimization techniques. One of the things that players absolutely hate is when your game runs pretty terribly. If your game is really awesome but is running at 10 frames per second, people are not going to enjoy it. So optimization performance that is something you should definitely take very seriously. At the same time, it's also a tricky subject because every single game is going to be different, so it's kind of hard to come up with some general guidelines that work on literally every single use case. There are some tips that are great for one use case and not necessarily great for another one. So that is the tricky thing about talking about optimization. So over here, I say just that. So optimization is always a super tricky subject because every game is unique. So every game will require different techniques to improve upon. But here is a great general cheat sheet on many things you can do to help you improve performance. So here is an interesting post, basically just putting together a bunch of those techniques in one place. It is posted by Cyber Interactive. And by the way, here's a good use case for AI. So I just took that image and converted it into text to be quite a bit easier to read. So the first very obvious tip is to learn how to use the profiler. You just go into Window, then Analysis, Profiler. And up here in this window, you can see all kinds of stats. So you can click on it. And over here on either the timeline or the hierarchy, you can see exactly what functions your game is using and just how long each function is taking to the run. That should be your number one tip. That is probably the only tip that is actually applicable to literally every single game. Use the Profiler to identify hotspots in your game. And then you can use those to manually apply some optimizations on those hotspots. Then keep in mind garbage collection. Some of you might have heard this term, but you might not know exactly what it is. Basically, when you create objects in c -sharp, you are creating an object, and then when that object is no longer used, basically it's being queued up for destruction, and at some point in the future, basically c -sharp will decide, okay, I'm going to clean up this object, and when it does, basically it's going to collect the garbage that was generated and clear that up. Now, that's a great thing. That's one of the big benefits about c -sharp. It's how you don't have to manually worry about allocating memory yourself. That's all automatically. But the downside is that little garbage collection process that one can take quite a bit of time if you have a ton of garbage. So you have to keep in mind this exists. You want to try to minimize as much garbage as possible. Once again, you can use the inspect in order to find that out. So you can go here and you can see GC alloc. So this is how much garbage is being allocated per each frame. And over here in this case, you can see my player loop. Something is generating 368 bytes of garbage every single frame. And so over here in this script, so you can find it and you can try to fix that garbage. Alternatively, of course, you can call system.gc.collect in order to manually collect garbage yourself. So if you have something where the player is going into loading some kind of thing, perhaps you want to manually collect the garbage in that point in order to ensure that there are no stutters during the actual gameplay. So you can be selective about where you clean up the garbage. But again, the main option is to really just avoid generating garbage as much as possible. Then on variables, this one is actually incorrect. If you declare a local variable like this, if you declare a value type as a local variable, it will not generate garbage. So this one, don't worry about it. Basically, the main thing that generates garbage are going to be reference types, so objects and things like that. You can watch my c -sharp course to learn more about the language itself, learn about what are reference types, what are value types, what generates garbage, what doesn't. Definitely make sure you know that so you can optimize your game. Next, we've got debugging. So basically, remove all debug.log or print messages and use a custom script for debugging where it can easily be disabled. So yep, this is once again one of those situational sort of things. Having debug.logs, those are extremely useful as you're making your game. But yes, they do have an actual performance cost. If you are posting a debug.log on every single update, it is going to have a noticeable impact on your frame rate. So on your final build, you should absolutely not have any logs that run on every single update, but having some logs that happen every once in a while so that you actually know what the game is doing in the backend, those can still be very helpful if, for example, your player encounters some kind of bug and you want to be able to tell how did that bug happen in order to be able to fix it. And for that, logs are definitely essential, but yes, they do have a cost. So if you want to maximize the efficiency to the absolute max, if so, then yep, removing logs would be a good option. Then game objects set all scene objects that do not move as static. This basically helps with rendering and dynamic matching. So if you have objects in your scene that are meant to be static and they're never going to move, if so, you can select those objects with those renders. And then over here on the inspector, over here, you can either toggle it as static. Now checking this one will make it static on literally everything, or you can check this little arrow icon. And over here, you can define how exactly it's going to be static. But yep, if you make it static and then you check on the stats, you will then be able to see a lot of those assets are going to be batched. So if you have lots of static things in your game, things that are never going to move, like the entire environment, make sure you mark it as static, which will definitely boost performance by quite a bit on the rendering side. By the way, this over here is the shop simulator prototype that I included in my CodeMonkey Toolkit asset. And then we've got instantiating and destroying objects. So do all instantiating outside of gameplay. Instantiating can cause stutter. Yep, anytime you call instantiate and you pass in some kind of prefab, that is going to have a little bit of stutter. So in order to have some nice smooth gameplay, you want to avoid that as much as possible. Although again, as I'm talking about these optimization techniques, I got to go back to the first original disclaimer. Some techniques are great in some places and not great in other ones. 
In this particular case, yes, calling instantiate won't cause a stutter, but that might not necessarily be a problem. If you instantiate a thousand objects, that is going to be a problem. You should definitely use some kind of object pooling and you should instantiate those during load time as opposed to during actual gameplay. But if you are just spawning just a single VFX prefab, that is perfectly fine. Don't worry about over-optimizing a bunch of those tiny, tiny things. Then GC spikes often accompany creating or destroying large numbers of objects due to memory allocation. So yep, any object that you create, if you destroy it, it will then have to be deallocated. So once again, it goes back to the same issues about garbage collection. Then pre-instantiate your object pool at an opportune time, such as during a loading screen when the users won't notice the stutter. So yep, object pooling is an excellent way to avoid these kinds of stutters with spawning and destroying objects. So definitely make sure you know about the object pooling pattern. Then if you have instantiating large prefabs like maps, and the tip is to use addressables, Addressables is a great way to have a bit more control over your memory management. I made a video on it on how you can actually use addressables. It does support async loading, so that is why it is recommended for very large things, so your screen doesn't actually freeze while you're waiting to load some kind of giant map. Then the other tip is something I already mentioned, so use object pooling. This can reduce stuttering that may result from garbage collection spikes. So use case for this, making projectile systems, so reusing bullets, missiles, or other projectiles. Then for enemy spawning, creating and destroying enemies efficiently. For particle effects, managing particle systems to avoid persona bottlenecks, and then for UI elements, pulling dynamic UI elements to improve performance. So yep, anytime you want to constantly spawn and destroy a bunch of things, always use an object pool. Or once again, I should not say always because again, it is all dependent on the particular use case. But in most cases, if you want the most performance possible, then an object pool is going to be better than doing instantiate all the time. Then for collisions, go to project settings physics and make only the objects that are supposed to collide with each other collide. So this is a really nice performance tip that not many people know about. If you go here into edit and then into project settings, then over here go down into the physics tab, and over here under settings you can see, yep, the layer collision matrix. So over here you can see basically all the layers that you have both on top and on the side, and over here you can see the matrix about which layers are going to collide with each other. So if you have things like, for example, the player is never meant to collide with, let's say, enemies, then find the player layer, find the enemies layer, and make sure that checkbox is not toggled. That way we'll ensure that those physics collisions do not happen. And of course, if the physicism has to calculate fewer collisions, then it's going to be quite a bit more performant. Then on the particle system, the particle system component contains a setting for the max number of particles. Ensure to only set it to what you need. So yep, this is a pretty obvious performance step. If you don't need a million particles, then don't spawn a million particles. Limit it to just what you need. That is going to be quite a bit more efficient. Then use structs instead of classes. So use structs instead of classes for holding data about objects. They are much faster. This again, one of those where sort of depends. In general terms, yes, structs are going to be value types. So they are going to be much faster in terms of memory. But at the same time, structs do have some downsides or not downsides where they have particular quirks due to the way they work. So they're not necessarily applicable in every single use case. If you just flat out replace a class for a struct, you might get a performance boost, but you might also break a ton of things. So this is definitely not something you should apply pretty much to every single problem. It should definitely be, once again, on a single use case. In order to learn more about the topic, definitely go ahead and check out my C-Sharp course. In there, I have lectures on both structs, how they differ from classes, and what are the difference between value types and reference types. Then in 3D models, use LDs level of detail. This is basically how you can take a model and you make a very high quality version, so something that has a mountain of vertices, then another one with fewer ones, fewer and fewer. So basically, as the object gets further away from the camera, you don't need to render millions of vertices. You can render just 10% and it will probably look very good because again, it's all far away. You can either generate those LEDs manually or there are some tools on the SR to do that. And I believe Unity is also working on an auto LED feature, although I think that one is only going to come out in Unity 7 or something like that. Then for UI, the canvas rebuilds for every change. So yep, this is something you should be aware of. Basically, if you have a canvas object and in that canvas, you got all kinds of things, Anytime you modify any of these objects over here, you are basically going to trigger a refresh of the entire canvas. So depending on how many things you have in your canvas at once, and depending on how often you update each of those things, depending on that, it might actually be wise to have multiple canvases and put the things that update pretty much all the time, like on every single update, put those on a single canvas, then things that only update, let's say once per second, put them on a different canvas, and basically separate multiple canvases depending on how often they update. Doing it like that can definitely help save you quite a few milliseconds, so if you have issues with rendering specifically on the canvas, look into that. Try to split your rendering into multiple canvases as opposed to just having one giant one that has all of your UI elements. And for scene objects or 3D models that are far away, switch them to build boards instead of the 3D model or a much less detailed one. So again, a similar strategy to over here, the LODs. Basically on the LODs, you still have a 3D object. You just make it much fewer vertices for when it's far away. And for build boards, those are literally just quads. Again, there are a bunch of awesome tools on the asset store to help you do exactly that. 
So you've got, for example, your full fledged 3D model. The whole thing has, for example, 11,000 triangles. And then you can convert it into literally just a quad that has an image applied to it. That's literally all built for this. And of course, that instead of having 11,000 triangles, it just has to. So if you have something very far away, it won't be noticeable. The fact that it's not a 3D object, the fact that it's actually a 2D uh, flat object, that really will not be noticeable. So by using this, you can massively cut down how many triangles you have, which in turn will definitely help you boost performance. So if this is a great optimization cheat sheet, then over here, are some more bonus tips. So avoid generating garbage in the first place. So literally what I said, if you don't generate garbage, then it doesn't have to be collected. So avoid generating it as much as possible. Then you can merge VFX into single meshes. This one is a bit more complex, but if for example, you have the VFX of like a building crumbling down, instead of doing it as VFX with all kinds of physics simulation at all, instead of doing that every single time, just bake it into a mesh, bake it with some kind of texture, then use some kind of vertex shader, and basically can generate the same animation that seems very fluid, but in reality, it's not using physics, it's not using tons of separate meshes, it's really just a single mesh that is being animated in an interesting way. Then you can use build boards instead of the last LOD. So again, same thing, a very far away LOD. Technically, you might not need, uh, let's say, a thousand polygons if you can get away with literally just two. So that's great. Another tip is to use baked lighting. If you want to make your game look gorgeous, then you absolutely need to look into baked lighting. This is the standard trick that games, AAA games, have used for many, many years. You can't really generate this kind of high quality lighting at runtime. If you try doing that, it won't run on pretty much any PC. So you basically just bake the lights, meaning you pre-calculate, you pre-compute all the lights beforehand, and then when the player is playing their game, they're really just applying textures that already have all the lighting pre-applied. Here in Unity, you go into Window, then go into Rendering, Lighting, and then over here you can define all kinds of settings for your lighting. So you can define to enable bake global illumination, then over here define what kind of light mapper you want to use, then all kinds of settings, then click on Generate Lighting, which is basically going to bake the lighting, bake it into a texture, which is then applied to all the meshes. Then the tip that I mentioned, multiple canvases to avoid constant repainting. So yep, split your UI elements into different canvases and use occlusion culling. This is basically where you don't render things that are not visible. So if you've got some kind of really complex mesh over here, but there's a wall in front of it, there's really no point in wasting time rendering this mesh. If it's hidden, then it shouldn't be rendered at all. Unity has a built-in method on how to do occlusion culling. So basically objects that are being blocked, they are not going to be rendered. And if you want to learn more about that, I have a lecture on it in my Ultimate TNT Overview course. And over here, my best general performance tip of all, remember how you don't have to run logic on every single update. For example, your fine target logic likely does not need to run 60 times per second. Just five times per second will likely be more than enough. And this is definitely my best general performance tip that is applicable to literally any game you want. There's lots of logic in your game, in your gameplay logic, that you don't have to run on every single update. This example, the player will not notice if your fine target doesn't run 60 times per second. If it runs five times per second, then that means it's going to run every 0.2 seconds. And that is going to be more than enough time for the players to look at the game and see, okay, it seems to be running in real time. Even though you are saving a ton of milliseconds by just not running that logic on every single update. And to build upon this, another one is if you have things that you do need to do almost on every single update, remember how you can actually offset them. So you can do, for example, on frame one, you find targets, then on frame two, you apply collisions, then on frame three, you apply some mesh deformation. So you can split your logic across different frames. And doing so, once again, you solve performance by using this, by making sure you don't do everything on every single update, and then you do different tasks on different frames, and doing so, your game will run nice and smooth. So for me, I love performance optimization. I love using the profiler, looking at all the functions and their timings, then diving in and refactoring to make it super faster and generate zero garbage. That's one task that I always find super satisfying. I love doing that in the polished lecture of my dots course. So yeah, obviously, if you want to get insane performance, then I highly recommend you look into Unity Dots. This is basically how you can render some code literally 200 times faster. The whole thing is based on using data-oriented design as opposed to object-oriented. So it avoids all those issues with garbage and avoids all kinds of cache misses. So things where the memory is constantly jumping around back and forth. Basically, Dots use all kinds of interesting quirks that work directly with how the CPUs work nowadays in order to very efficiently cycle through memory, in order to do all kinds of operations on all kinds of objects, and do that in an insanely fast manner. Like I said, this is an actual real example from the course. It's how we convert the code and make it run the exact same code 260 times faster. So yep, if you want extreme performance, I highly recommend you look into Unity Dots. And yep, this is a nice cheat sheet of optimization techniques. So if you have any kind of issues with optimization in your games, then hopefully these tips will help. By the way, I wrote about this in my Game Dev Report newsletter. This is a newsletter that I write every single week with all of the weekly news and any interesting Game Dev articles that I come across. Sign up for free with a link in the description. By the way, right now there's a great humble bundle with lots of gorgeous environments in VFX. The whole thing is 99% off. 
For example, you have this gorgeous Victorian mansion, kind of like Resident Evil 7. Then this Asian dynasty environment also looks super detailed. This sci-fi engineering room would look great in pretty much any kind of spaceship or really any kind of sci-fi game. And for VFX, it also has a ton of gorgeous packs. You've got this really nice sci-fi shields. Then this one has some gorgeous tuned projectiles. This one has even more silly projectiles and some nice bullets. Or this one with some really nice AOE abilities. So you have giant bundle, some are unreal assets, but a lot of them are Unity assets. And even in real ones, you can still use them inside Unity, since these are really just meshes. This whole bundle is worth two grand, you can get it just for 30 bucks. Check it out with the link in the description. Alright, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.